Before the Bar Opens is proudly sponsored by Alexander Knight & Co, the accountants for entrepreneurs. Get a more proactive and professional service in 2022. Email hello at alexanderknightaccountants.co.uk and start the ball rolling. This is a special bonus episode of Before the Bar Opens with me, Emma Clark. We spoke to Simon Galloway, who is a music fan, musician, barbershop quartet singer, music trivia expert, founder of Glossop Record Club, host of the radio show Charity Shop Classics, and presenter of the music podcast The Giddy Carousel of Pop. And in this bonus episode, that's what we're going to talk about, Simon's podcast The Giddy Carousel of Pop. Buckle up. Now, you also present a podcast the Giddy Carousel of Pop, and that celebrates the pop magazine Smash Hits. Tell me about that. What's the format for the show? Uh, the format for the show is very simple. Um, Gavin from Charity Shop Classics, we both discovered that we've got a, a huge love for Smash Hits. One of his ambitions as a youngster was to be a writer for Smash Hits. And it would just pop up in conversation every now and then. And then when David Hepworth was coming to do Glossop Record Club and I knew that somewhere at my parents' house in the loft was my collection of Smash Hits magazines from sort of the mid-80s to the early 90s. And I knew that the Live Aid edition of Smash Hits was in that box. And what we wanted to do for that session with, with David was to, rather than have set questions was to have 10 items that we could pull out of a box hand to him and then it triggers some sort of discussion wow. from that and so i wanted to get my hands on this this issue of smash it so i was crawling around my mom and dad's loft and found the box and you know it was covered in dust and dead spiders and things and but i was going through them and i was just reminded of just how brilliant it was. The language that they used, um, Swingerillion, and uh, how they'd take the mickey out of the pop stars. Not in a horrible way. There was never anything nasty about it. It was always affectionate, wasn't it? It was never snide. It's like, oh, these pop stars, what a daft lot, eh? what are they doing now? It's that that, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, but also kind of making, making them a little more down-to-earth and a little more human, as well as celebrating their ridiculousness. And the RSVP pages where people would write in for pen pals I was just reading. I mean, first of all, reading that, you know, his full names and addresses are printed in there. You'd never get that now. Never do that now. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> Data protection and child safeguarding issues all over that one. <laughs> We've actually tracked down a few of the people who wrote into Smash It's to say, did you get any response to those letters? Because the names there, and you know, we've just mentioned, you know, the ones with more unusual names, you put them into Facebook and you find them. So you just drop them a little message. Wow. <laughs> and did they? Did they find pen pals? Yeah, yeah. There was one guy who uh, was looking for fellow Human League fans and has still got friends to this day that he made through writing it to the page of the Smash It's and getting letters sent back to him from all over wow. the world. Um, so yeah, the idea is simple, that we, we, we take a, an issue of the magazine and just go through it with a guest. We describe the guest as either a pop kid so that's, you know, uh, the, the likes of you and I. We didn't work on the magazine we're not a pop star, but a pop kid uh, who bought the magazine at the time uh, somebody who was involved in the magazine as a as a writer or or in some capacity, or someone who appeared on the, on the pages of the magazine itself, and so they're the three categories that we kind of work wow. with. I mean, we try and mix it up a little bit, but there's no kind of steadfast rule where right? it's going to be this one this month, that one that month. It's looking at that magazine at, at, from that time. What was your life like at that time? Yes. What else were you doing? Were you at school? What music were you listening to? Where did you get your music from? So it's trying to build that picture of that person, you know, if it's a pop kid, how their life was at that time. And people really relate to that. But also, if we get somebody who worked on the magazine, it's just fascinating to hear those insights. What was the office like? Uh, Neil Tennant was a writer on Smash It's What was it like, you know, before he was famous sort of thing? It's like, oh, yeah, well, he, you know, know plays tapes on the answer phone <laughs> the demo tapes and we'd have like yeah yeah that's okay and you know just carry on with whatever they were doing um and then we've not done uh, well no actually we have done a full episode with someone who appeared on its pages but not necessarily a, a pop star it's paul hanley who was in the fall in the early 1980s and that was fascinating because he was only 17 at that time he was in the band also appearing in smash it's but that was also when the fall went on tour in america and um they decided that he he wasn't old enough to handle going abroad and so they got another drummer and left him at home it was the issue that we were looking at 
bang smack when the fall went off to America, you know. Wow. Um, it's just interesting to hear, hear all these different aspects. And, we, you know, we've had um, somebody get in touch who lives in Australia, um, grew up in Australia, and even though uh, Australia eventually got their own version of Smash It, she used to get the British version delivered <laughs> every fortnight. And obviously she was, like, a couple of weeks behind all the issues, and uh, you know she's a comedy writer now, and um, and she's going to be guesting on the podcast. And she says, you know, this is thirty seven years of my life have been building up to this, and we're feeling under pressure now <laughs> to make sure that we, you know we can make her moment as special as possible. But yeah, we, we get all sorts of people getting in touch, you know, via social media, just sharing their stories of smash hits. Whether it's just I had this issue, or I had this poster on my wall, or I had this Madonna poster on my wall, and used to kiss it before I went to bed every night. So people, yeah, you know, just retweet eating it and sharing it and yeah, he's got a good healthy listenership and people chip in a few quid if they want to on like a patreon type thing that we use so again it's it's about the community that that builds up around it and not necessarily nostalgia but that's certainly a, a part of it and it's it's more contrasting uh you know we, we've got the beautiful power of hindsight when we're doing this thing so contrasting you know what it was like then to how it is now and you know what became of these pop stars and oh dear it all went a bit wrong for them he was a wrong one or something like that all the show notes for this bonus episode are available in the description and there's a bunch more stuff at before the bar opens.com you can follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever you like. I'm at Emma B. Clark, and there's an E on the end of Clark. Before the Bar Opens is created by me and is produced by Rick Watson. I compose the theme music we use on Before the Bar Opens, and you can hear the full piece on our website, beforethebaropens.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, leave us a review, hopefully a really nice one, and tell your friends. Another episode will be along really soon, so don't miss it. Thanks for listening.